morning. You are with the Vermont House Government Operations Committee. We are um, here together on Thursday morning to uh, hopefully finish off our work on S-124. Uh, we've got one um, sort of substantive change this morning to look at that, uh, that we've invited Peter Gregory to be uh, with us for and to, uh, to help us understand uh, and that's the issue around uh, municipal um, emergency response plans and, uh, and whether we have a different way of inventorying what, uh, what is available to different municipalities in terms of fire, EMS, and police services across the state. Um, and my intention this morning is for us to uh, to hear this testimony and then to go to the uh, fresh draft that Betsy Ann has um, provided to Andrea and is going up on our committee page this morning. Uh, and we will continue um, going through that, you know, making any final edits that we want to um, with the intention of getting to mark up and vote before we're done here today. Um, keeping in mind that 11 o'clock uh, Betsy Ann and I need to take a time out and go to the appropriations committee room, which hopefully is more fun than a time out. But uh, we will also take Nolan with us at that point because he's created a fiscal note. And so um, we'll have a, a moment to review that with Nolan this morning after we talk with Peter Gregory. Um, so you all will get a little bit of a break um, late morning, uh, and then we'll come back to uh, to finish the bill and vote it out of committee so that uh, hopefully we can finish that before the two o'clock floor time. Uh, Betsy Ann, what's your schedule today? Do you have a, an afternoon commitment with our Senate counterparts? Good morning. I don't believe so. I think I'm on your same schedule. Excellent. Yes, I am. All I right. have no after meeting schedule. Excellent, thank you. <laughs> All right, so um, Peter Gregory, why don't we invite you to um, to share with us your? Oh, Rob has a question. Go ahead, Rob. Well, it's just so. So we're we're. I didn't check the schedule, so we're going to go beyond the ten thirty mark in committee discussion. Correct, obviously. Um, if we need to, yes. Okay, because I have. I have a noon um, Zoom with, well, with the, the Gov, um, but so if we can just play it by ear, I'll, I'll let you know if that works, Madam Chair. Yeah, I don't think it will take us too much past noon. I think we can probably um, work with focus and diligence and try to get us out of here mm -hmm. by well, then. That's my hope. If you come all the way over to our our side of things, you know, if we can debate. I'm pretty sure we can boot this out very quickly. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Oh, I appreciate your humor on a Thursday morning. <laughs> so, Peter Gregory, we sent you some um, some potential language and. Um, just wanted to hear your response to that and, and then open up a little bit of committee dialogue about how to, um, how to accomplish the intent of that section that came over to us from the Senate. And Betsy Ann, did you wanna jump in for just a moment here? Thank you. Hey, good morning. Yeah, just so everyone can look at the language that Mr. Gregory will be discussing. Um, I emailed to you a clean copy of draft 3.1 and you can find this language on uh, page 47. Mr. Gregory, it's the same language that I had sent you previously. Um, I just emailed it to you since I had um, only sent Andrea the docs for posting early this, this, this morning when I was getting on, so they might not be online yet. But everyone can look at this language together on page 47 in the attachment that I sent to you in uh, section, what's called now section 32 for regional planning commissions. All right. Good morning. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the committee. It's great to be with you. Um, thank you, Betsy Ann, for sending that to me yesterday. Uh, certainly this new section is a little bit, uh, uh, is, is much uh, better, I think, than the section that came over um, from the Senate that had some concerns. So 
this essentially is to uh, task the regional planning commissions with providing an inventory within a time certain period on all the different public safety uh, um, uh, services that are available within each of the regions. Uh, certainly support that. Uh, regional planning commissions are, you know, doing inventories all the time. So this is right up our bailiwick. Um, we have relationships with most of these uh, emergency services personnel um, because we staff the local emergency planning committees in most regions of the state. So it would be <clears throat> not a difficult task at all. And it, it um, feeds well into legislation that this committee helped uh, uh, usher through a few years ago, enabling RPCs to do shared services, which um, is certainly kicking off in some regions of the state, not so much on public safety, but in other areas like energy, like in my region. Um, so, you know, I support what you've done. I think we could do a good job. Um, I think the, the date that you have in the bill could be moved up if you are so inclined. Um, I think you have it at uh, 2024. I think, I think it could be done easily two years sooner. Um, I think this is a topic that uh, is very important for financial reasons for our communities, but also level of service. Um, so I think the sooner we can get this done and provide information to the communities on um, what's out there, where they may be able to work together, um, I think is, is, a, is a good goal. So I would suggest if you're so inclined to agree to move that up a couple of years, I don't think it's that big a task and I would like to um, provide that information to our communities and ultimately the citizens who are well served by good services. Excellent, thank you. Um, questions from committee members? Yes, Jim. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Peter, for joining us. Um, appreciate the comment about the the um, uh, re the requirement date. Uh, I'm I'm wondering if you share any of this information currently with the Department of Public Safety, uh, and whether you should, if we want a kind of a state collecting point as well. Uh, I don't believe we currently do because we don't really have a, a thorough, uh, inclusive uh, inventory of this information. I think uh, sharing it uh, with public safety would be a good good thing. Um, this would be an inventory that would need to be uh, kept current because you know mutual aid agreements change, uh, services change. Um, you know, so yeah, I think sharing it would be appropriate because we have a strong relationship with Vermont Emergency Management. We do receive some federal funding through them to do emergency planning. Anyway, um, that's really the source of funds that I think um, with VEM's blessing, we would use to actually do this inventory. So uh, I think it makes good sense, Representative Harrison, to do that. Great, thank you, Peter. Mm -hmm. Rob LeClaire. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, good morning, Peter. Good morning. So the the information that's currently being required in this piece of legislation, do you have most of it readily available now, or is there a fair amount of work to do to get it all from what you've seen? In our region, I think our knowledge and our strong relationships, we could probably pull it together rather quickly. I, I can't speak for other areas of the state how um, how up to speed they are. I mean, some regions of the state are quite large, NVDA, 50 some towns and, and a lot of different service providers probably. Um, so it would, I think it would vary. So it's hard to say, uh, make a statement that, yeah, we have it all pretty much in hand already. I would say not in most areas, but yes. And so. So it would require a fair amount of time and effort on some part, but others maybe are a little more up to up to date with that information. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, you know, but I, I, I you know, I wouldn't um, I characterize a fair amount of work as anything that's uh, overly daunting. I think it's really important work, and and I appreciate uh, whose ever idea this was to uh, include this section. Okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. All right, any other questions from committee members? All right, so committee, how do you feel about uh, 2022? <laughs> Am I on mute? <laughs> 
<laughs> okay, there we go. <clears throat> now I'm seeing a few reactions. All right, <clears throat> good deal. Looks like uh, if you have an objection on that, please, uh, please weigh in at this moment. All right, so Betsy Ann, it looks like we will pull that date um, forward. And um, and Peter, I thank you so much for taking a few minutes to be with us this morning. It's nice to see you in Zoom world. I don't think we've seen you since March. That's correct. So thank you for inviting me in and uh, listening to my thoughts on this. And uh, yes, it's very good to see you all as well. Well, we we look forward to continuing this work. Um, it's uh, <clears throat> it's important work for on behalf of our communities, and we're trying to find a way to get some of that work done without overburdening our our small <clears throat> volunteer, uh, largely volunteer select boards and and emergency planning commissions. So, thank you so much for uh, for being with us this morning, and uh, have have a great day. We'll. Uh, We'll see you again soon. Hope so. Thank you so much. Take care. <clears throat> All right. Um, I think that what I'd like to do now is take a few moments to go over the uh, the fiscal note that Nolan has created. So Nolan Wang Langwell, thank you for being with us this morning. Um, we we should just understand what uh, what numbers you came up with and um, and you know satisfy ourselves that we understand how you arrived at those numbers and and that we've looked at all possible um, budget implications. Sure, I haven't sent it yet because um, I just saw the latest version, mm -hmm. so I'm actually changing the section numbers. So. I will happily do that. I'm, I'm happy to put it up on the screen. Um, but if maybe if Andrea could give me host access so I can at least show what I have now. And then when I'm done, I can send the clean copy to everybody afterwards. Oh, well, that would be great. There you go. Okay. Um, oh, that's not it. Here we go. Okay. Uh, for the record, Noel Nangwell, the Joint Fiscal Office. Um, you'll have to forgive me. I'm a little late to the game here on this. Um, I was asked to do this yesterday. So um, I threw this together with the help of Betsy Ann. Um, so I will walk you through this really quick. Um, in short, there's no major fiscal impacts or appropriations required, but I'll walk you through the sections that um, I flagged. So section four, um, the Senate version of this would have uh, increased the, um, the membership for this particular commission from 12 to 20 members. Um, this version increases it from 12 to 24 members uh, and would allow um, members to receive re per diem compensation and reimbursements through 32 VSA 1010, which is the statutory that that dictates who gets what. And in short, people, if you are, even if you're entitled to it, if you're getting any kind of compensation from your work or anything else, you do not get compensation. So we assume this version has, your version has seven to nine public members. So I estimate that between seven and nine people may claim reimbursements for up to six meetings. And that would cost between 53 and $6,800 a year. However, the language does say the cost will be covered by monies appropriated to the council. So given the nominal costs, I do not believe that this are any additional appropriations at this time. So there's a cost, but nothing that I believe you need to go to appropriations and say, we need to have more money. I think this can be captured within the budget. Um, section seven, um, um, I flagged this, not because this is what I heard, but according to, to um, Betsy Ann, we had, there was testimony from the council on this particular section around, um, I think it was certification, where they said that the council believes that this restructure could not be done by July 1, 2021. I would need more staff and money to carry this out. Um, I've sent, I've been trying to have a back and forth a little bit with folks over at the council to to just follow up on this um, I, and we've been playing phone tag. So I'm hoping to sort of 
tie this up before 11 o'clock. But I had to flag it because if we, when we add things in law or in, in bills where the agency says that it could cost them money, I flag it. Um, I'm not saying that you need to add more money. I'm just flagging it as a, as a flag. Section 22, I just sort of highlight because anytime we do anything that changes boards, I always just flag it and say, you know, was there any per diems required? And in this case, there really were no per diems required. So there's no appropriations required for this section of the bill. Uh, I just put it in there because anytime we do stuff with boards, I just sometimes I'll flag things even when they don't have an appropriation just out of habit. Um, and then finally, section 17, this is the section that requires DPS to finally adopt rules regarding dispatch rates um, by July 1, 2021 but it also requires the rules to provide a minimum of three years following adoption before the rates they contain are imposed. So essentially it's a three year moratorium. That said, when I talk to DPS, they do not, they're not currently billing local entities for these dispatch costs anyway. So there's no loss of revenue because they're not, or they're not currently billing. What they told me is that if there's an entity the entities that they provide dispatch for, they're not charging, they're getting for free, but there's a lot of other, other local entities that are getting their dispatch from other places and they're being billed quite significantly. So there's sort of a disparity in the system. So, um, so but in, in terms of DPS, there wouldn't be any lost revenues. So that's the highlight in a nutshell. I don't know if anybody has questions. All right, committee members. What are your questions? Great. All right, I don't see anybody diving in. I will, um, like I said, I will um, clean this up and then I will send it to Andrea to post. Thank you, Betsy Ann, just thank Oh, thank you. Thank you, Nolan. I just wanted to give a heads up under this uh, draft 3.1, the dispatch language would change a bit. Um, the This House committee is considering eliminating that um, or proposing to eliminate the uh, dispatch rulemaking provision and instead have essentially a moratorium until um, the General Assembly establishes a fee structure. Um, the way that this draft 3.1 is currently set up um, and it is in what's now called scrolling through um, section 25, uh, it would allow DPS to continue to charge under current contracts it has. So that was drafted with the understanding that they did have some contracts and were charging. That was based on prior testimony talking about some uh, charges. So if it's accurate that DPS is not charging at all, um, perhaps the language should be updated then to reflect that if this committee will still pursue its moratorium until there's a fee structure. Okay. I heard, I, I had an email exchange with Rick Hollenbach at DPS who told me that they were not currently charging. Maybe okay. from Thank somebody you. just That's to confirm time. that. And I will update my fiscal note to reflect the latest language. Again, I'm, I'm playing catch up. Yeah, things are moving. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. no, thank you for flagging that for me. Thank you. Yes, we're, uh, we're making changes in real time here. So I appreciate you um, sprinting to catch up and, uh, and, and getting us something that we can take to discuss with the Appropriations Committee later this morning. Um, committee, any other changes, questions, concerns uh, with respect to the fiscal note that Nolan has gone over with us? Nobody's diving for their little blue hand. All right. Thank you, Nolan. I appreciate you being with us this morning and we'll, uh, we'll see you later on this morning. And uh, when you have a, a final draft of that, if you want to share that over with us, that would be, that would be helpful. We're going to get back to the bill language. Thank you. All right, Betsy Ann, you have um, an annotated and a clean version. So probably we should run through the annotated just so that we can uh, be oriented to, to the changes. Yes, sounds good. Hello again. Um, if 
thank you to Andrea for posting these docs. They're on your webpage now. There are uh, two drafts. There's a draft 3.1 annotated and the 3.1 clean copy. The 3.1 annotated is your um, running draft of changes to the bill as passed the Senate. Um, and then the, for the clean copy, what I've done is just started to take that annotated version and incorporate the annotations and put it into a real uh, strike all amendment format, an official format. So what I have done at the direction of the chair is put together this draft 3.1. Um, looking at the annotated version, I have flagged in purple highlighting in the comment boxes the changes that you have not reviewed yet that were made since yesterday's meeting. And we can start on page one. And the first change um, would be to change the name of the Criminal Justice Training Council to be the Criminal Justice Council um, in order to reflect the full scope of the powers and duties of the council, which relate to training, certifying, and professionally regulating law enforcement officers. So the first change related to this topic is in section one, just redesignating the name of the current council chapter with its new title, Criminal Justice Council. Section two would be a uh, directive for legislative council to use statutory revision authority to change that name accordingly. Starts out by saying in subsection A in section two, that in order to fully reflect all of its powers and duties, which relate to training, certifying, and professionally regulating law enforcement officers. The Criminal Justice Training Council is renamed the Vermont Criminal Justice Council. Sub B contains the Ledge Council Stat Rev Directive, which is that when preparing the VSA for publication, Office of Legislative Council shall replace Criminal Justice Training Council with Criminal Justice Council, as long as those revisions have no other effect on the meaning of the statutes. Um, and that's where we would not prepare a bill, um, but then uh, instead just use that revision authority to update the statutes with that name change. And I will pause there, Madam Chair, for any further discussion on that. All right, this creates the name change and, um, and has it permeated throughout statute wherever the council is mentioned. Questions, comments, concerns? All right, uh, John Gannon. Well, I just thought that this was in keeping with what the council is currently doing. Um, e even if we weren't to uh, amend um, uh, the law with respect to it, the training council doesn't just do training, but also handles professional misconduct. Um, and I, I think it would be confusing to the public um, to understand what this body does if you keep the word training in there. So that's that was my thoughts um, to, to make it more understand, understandable to the public what this does and that it's not just limited to training. I think that's a good suggestion. Um, and I, I definitely appreciate that. Um, any committee members? feeling like we need to keep this open for discussion or should we move on to section three? Going forward, okay, take it away. All right, on page two, section three, uh, the only update here on line five is just that same update we just discussed about the name of the council. Um, you have already discussed adding um, or correcting the name of recruits to be law enforcement applicants in B1 on line 10. And you have already discussed that B2 about adding to the description of the council its current law duties to professionally regulate officers. You had already reviewed that language. And then on line 17, you had already reviewed the language about adding in that the council also approves programs of instruction in addition to offering them. So I'm moving on to page three. And the next change that uh, is new for today is updating um, or re further revising the membership of the council. 
So I'm on page three, line six, you'll see that updating change about the name of the council, but then the changes that would occur on line seven and eight here is to maintain the current law requirement that the Commissioner of Corrections serves on the council and additionally maintaining the Senate's proposal on line eight to have the Commissioner of Mental Health um, be, have a seat on the council. In addition, um, if you scroll over to page four, on line 16, there's a language about the public members. Your previous draft had five public members appointed by the governor and then one public member appointed or jointly elected by the chapters of the Vermont NAACP. Um, as a follow-up, this instead would have seven public members all appointed by the governor um, and then on line 20 and 21, stating that at least one of these members shall be a mental health crisis worker, which was a substitute for social worker that you discussed. On page five, at least one of these members would be an individual with a lived experience of a mental health condition or psychiatric disability. And then at least two of these members shall be chosen from among persons nominated by the Vermont chapters of the NAACP. And each of these members shall represent a different Vermont double, NAA, double NAACP chapter. And in order to assist the governor in making these appointments, because these would be gubernatorial appointments instead of jointly elected by the NAACP chapters, each chapter instead would nominate at least three individuals for these gubernatorial appointments. Marcia Gardner has a question. Let's see, and what's our final count? So under this, now you would be up to a total uh, membership of 23 members. And you had previously discussed what the balance would be um, for law enforcement related versus non-law enforcement related. And by my count, you're now up to um, 12 of law enforcement related and, uh, no, sorry, we'll have to go, I think it's 12 and 13, or no, 12 and 12, 11 and 12, I'm sorry, we have to go back through and count. It's definitely a closer balance. Uh, I think you should go through, we should count ourselves to confirm if you wanna go through that balance. Yeah, I think we should. Um, that was That was something that was, very important to us and we want to make sure that when we um, present this change that we have a final count. Do you want to do that now, Madam Chair? Yeah, let's go ahead. Um, back up to page three. Can somebody else uh, keep track of who's in what column? I might know. I'll do it too, but if somebody can double check. Yep, absolutely. All right. Public safety corrections. Commissioner of Public Safety is one. Yeah. Commissioner of Corrections is two. Motor vehicles is three. Fish and wildlife is four. Mental health. I think you've discussed before is the non-law enforcement. AG law enforcement, as you discussed, executive director of the Department of State's Attorneys and Sheriffs, you discussed as law enforcement, executive director of racial equity, you with non-law enforcement, troopers association, law enforcement, police association, law enforcement, Chiefs of Police Association, Law Enforcement, Sheriff's Association, Law Enforcement, Law Enforcement Officer appointed by VSEA, Law Enforcement, the LCT you've discussed as Law Enforcement, individual appointed by the Executive Director of the Center for Crime Victim Services, Non-Law Enforcement, 
individual appointed by executive director of human rights commission non-law enforcement individual appointed by executive director of the network against domestic and sexual violence non-law enforcement and then the seven public members um, appointed by the governor So actually Looks like 12 and 12 to me 12 and 12 yes 24. <clears throat> All right, well, let's continue with that unless committee has a question. Uh, Jim Harrison. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so I, I think as we left it yesterday, we still have some differences of opinion on the chair uh, appointment. Um, so I don't know if you want to talk about that now, if you want to flag it and go through the rest of the bill. Uh, we should talk about it right now because my aim is to get us to a point where we give Betsy Ann instructions on uh, a final draft to mark up and vote. Okay, understanding there's some differences, I would just throw out again um, my suggestion from yesterday, and that is to let the council continue to uh, elect its own chair. Um, and hopefully, um, the, uh, because of all the changes and makeup uh, that they see the value of trying to um, work together and elect someone uh, within their own um, body uh, to lead them forward. All right, committee discussion, Marsha Gardner. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I just wonder what the appearance would be to the public if out of the gate this committee elects a chair who is a member of the law enforcement um, portion. Uh, I wonder if the public would see that as um, somewhat of a betrayal and look at it as, well, we just gave them lip service with all of these public hearings that we uh, conducted. And um, I'm wondering if we should stick with the language as it is. Another thought is having served on a number of uh, committees and councils when I was working for the state, ones that are associated directly with either the governor's office or the administration um, seem to have more power uh, others can languish if they don't have a direct connection to, uh, to the governor. So uh, I'm thinking maybe we should stick with the language as it is. Thanks, Marsha. JP? I would uh, just renew my preference that the uh, chair be elected by the uh, council. Rob LeClaire. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, well, I, I guess I have several comments about this. One is, um, I, I have to say, I'm a little concerned about the overall number here. 24 seems to be a very large board and I'm concerned it could be unwieldy. Secondly, um, if we're 24 and we're evenly split, um, I recall us having a conversation around a charter change here not too long ago that there was concern about an even numbered board. So I'm guessing if that was a concern, then it should be a concern here. And as much as I have the utmost respect for the member from Richmond, um, I, I absolutely disagree with the fact that the current language is that you could never have anybody from law enforcement, as I interpret that, ever chair this. And I totally disagree that that should be taken off the table. We have changed the makeup of this group by a dramatic shift here. And I can't imagine anybody would think that we're just gave it lip service when you take a look at the makeup of this board compared to what it was before. Um, so I, I 
have some major concerns. And as it stands right now, there's very little about this particular section that I could support. But thank you, Madam Chair. Thanks, Rob. Hal? Uh, thanks, Madam Chair. Um, I agree with the member from Barry. This is dramatic. And I think what's going on in our state and in our country with regards to law enforcement needs dramatic change. And I think we can't forget law enforcement works for the public. It works for us. And we need to have a say in how things are played out, how policies formed, and you need to have the community voice front and present as an equal. And law enforcement has always been in charge of its process. And this is a change. This is a dramatic change and it's long overdue. Uh, Bob Hooper. Um, I think Marcia's points are well taken. Um, this is about optics. I mean, living in Burlington, driving past the uh, encampment two or three times a day. Uh, one of the big issues is whether or not there is the perception of responsibility as Hal just brought up um, for a group of people that work for us, quote unquote, uh, and who are they responsible to. Uh, even city council is now doubting that they have responsibility. So the optics I think are very important and we have put two things in place here. Uh, good optics to begin with and a review process down the road if it doesn't work the way it should. Uh, to Rob's point of an equal number of people, I think there's a marked difference between the governance of a citizen group that comes together as opposed to a uh, group that is designed to represent the needs of citizens, which the charter change would have done. Um, all boards don't necessarily have their chair as a non-voting member. So uh, that could be something that this group could decide themselves. I uh, lean towards Marsha's position. Thank you. Mike Merwicki. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, as I wrote in the chat, I like to keep the language as is. Uh, there's a lot of reasons why I think that and primarily uh, <clears throat> not to confuse the military <clears throat> with the police, but I was talking with someone who's recently retired from a, from a career in the military and uh, <clears throat> we were talking about the, the civilian role in the military and he shared that as a career military person who, who actually teaches um, and still teaches, he taught at all the the military academies and the, the war college. Um, he says it, it's, it's essential in a democracy for there to be civilian oversight of, of the military. And, and I think this takes us a step in the direction of providing some civilian oversight in what has until now been um, um, oversight from only within the group that it's open providing oversight to. And I think it's essential for us to start to expand that and recognize uh, we are in a changing world. Uh, it's important that there be checks and balances. However, um, in whatever part of government we're talking about, and this is just a small way to start that process of, of having a more balanced perspective here on this council. Anybody else want to weigh in on this? All right, since this is the first um, major point of divergence of opinions, I think it would be helpful for us to straw poll this um, so that we understand what we're looking at, recognizing that many other sections of this bill um, are, are uh, sort of agreed upon by most, if not all. Um, so if you are in favor of leaving the language as is, uh, please raise your hand, a real hand. All right, I see seven. 
And if you are in favor of pursuing um, one of the proposed changes, um, we had a couple different ideas thrown out over the last day or two, um, please raise your hand. I'm sorry, I'm not raising my hand. That's okay, Madam Chair, you can vote twice. I'm gonna show you how to do it, but then I'm not gonna count my hand. Um, so that looks like a seven four. All right. Um, thank the committee for respectful uh, debate and dialogue about this. And I understand that this is a major change um, in not only the makeup of the council, but now um, proposing a change in the leadership of the council. And I just wanna say, you know, to this group um, and to anyone else out there who's listening, um, if we're all back in the Government Operations Committee room in January, I would be happy to have us uh, pledge to keep an eye on this, keep an eye on how that balance is working, um, listen to the newly constituted council and allow them to um, allow them to weigh in on whether this is uh, a workable leadership of the council. Um, so I'm keeping an open mind and, and right now I'm tipping in favor of the, the voices who've come to us and said, um, we want more civilian, uh, um, uh, not leadership, but more civilian cooperation in, in terms of how we train and, um, and certify and do, uh, professional, conduct oversight with law enforcement. So um, that gets us through the bottom of page five, I believe, or the top of page six. Yes, um, move on. The language here that Nolan already discussed is to, um, instead of the Senate passed version, which said that only the public members, the Define public members of the council shall be entitled to per diem compensation. This language at the bottom of page five um, that you had discussed, you discussed the per diems, this would say instead that the members of the council shall be entitled to receive per diem compensation and reimbursement of expenses as permitted under 32 VSA 1010 from monies appropriated to the council. What this means in practice is that under the terms of 32 VSA 1010, a person cannot get a per diem if they are already being paid by another source. So for example, the ex officios that serve on this uh, council because they are a commissioner, um, they're already getting paid a state salary, it, they would not get an additional per diem for serving on this commission, on the council. Um, the language also says uh, that a per any member of a board or commission can get reimbursement of actual and necessary expenses. So for example, if for any person, any member of the council that drives to a meeting, they would be able to claim um, gas mileage. So Nolan had already worked, walked you through just the uh, fiscal impact of this, but it would just use the general law authority for obtaining per diems and expense reimbursement instead of only saying specific members, um, the public members get per diems because for example, we don't know yet who the, uh, for example, executive director of human rights commission will appoint. That could be somebody serving just a, a virtually a, a public member. Okay there. We are on page six in regard to this um, section five transitional provision. The only update is to remove the training from the council's name. Um, this is that language that says an existing member of the council who will serve on the council under new membership can serve the remainder of their term in effect immediately prior to that change. So it's at least possible that some of the members um, that will get a seat under the new council membership are already serving. Um, for example, there is a um, member of the Chiefs of Police Association appointed by the president of the association. If that same, um, if the, that person now is getting specifically a seat, but it's possible that that will be the same person appointed by the president of the association 
um, the same person that's already serving on the council. And so in order to maintain um, their current terms and when they expire, that language says that they can just uh, serve out the remainder of their term. And then in section five on subsection B, um, you had discussed this deadline to appoint the new council membership that's currently set at November 15th of this year. You, I'm move, moving on to section six, just a reminder, this is the requirement for the council to make changes in its training structure. Um, in subsection A, there was the language you already reviewed about the council being required to adopt rules to identify and implement alternate routes to certification aside from training provided at the academy. No change there discussed from the language as past Senate. Um, top of page seven is that language you already reviewed that the council has to offer courses of instruction for officers in different areas of the state and strive to offer non-overnight courses whenever possible. Jim Harrison has a question. Sorry. Um, so uh, it, it, can I take it that we're sticking with the November 15th on the new membership of the council, even in spite of the short time frame and a lot of other things going around? Yeah, we did have a committee discussion about that yesterday, and I'm happy to open that up for discussion again today. I think the um, the intention with leaving the November um, deadline is that we have a lot of tasks that this bill is asking the council to achieve and that we wanted the new membership to be a part of some of the reports back that are contemplated later in the bill. Yeah, no, I, I I understand and I appreciate that. I just, I think there's gonna be a rush. It's like pulling names out of a hat um, in a month and a half uh, to do that. So I would encourage us to think about postponing that to January 1st or something. I just, um, even later in December, I just think we're, we're rushing that, but I may be a minority of one, which, uh, it is what it is, so. Other committee discussion on the timeline? Um, Madam Chair? Yes, do you have a little blue hand or do you wanna raise yeah. your actual hand? <laughs> Go ahead, Bob. <laughs> actual hand up, I couldn't find my blue one. I have too many things open on the screen. Um, so this, this would be an absolute cutoff date by which all members would need to be appointed, but if people are appointed earlier, there would be no uh, prohibition once the law is signed to them taking part in all decisions that are made, right? This is a drop dead date for... That's a good question. Betsy Ann, how does that work? As currently drafted, the effective date of the new membership is also November, 5th, November 15th. Um, that effective date is at the end of the bill. So the as it's currently constructed, um, the new membership would begin on November 15th. And yeah, that's kind of an issue. I agree that we should have as much participation as early as possible. Um, so either that would need to be bifurcated or stick with early, in my opinion. Well, the council in an ordinary time meet, would meet at least quarterly. And I understand that they have been meeting more like monthly in recent times. Um, and so I don't know how many meetings they already have scheduled between now and November 15th. Um, just throw that out as a, a point of context, uh, Warren. Let's see. Yes, um, I basically am in agreement with Jim. I think November 15th is just so tight that the, the concept of drawing names out of a hat <laughs> rings true with me. And I, I would think if we put it at the end of the year, that would be at least a little bit of breathing room. We've got so much going on between now and November 15th. We may not, we may not even know who our president is going to be by November 15th. Uh, the, the way things are looking in some states. So I'd certainly like to postpone that a bit, not a whole lot, but a bit. 
That's it. So Betsy Ann, I, I think it would be helpful for us to, to orient ourselves to the various tasks that we have um, asked the council to undertake and understand what the what the due dates are of those various tasks so that we can appreciate um, how many of those might need to get started now in order to be done by the time we contemplated having them report back to us. And the bill contains uh, reports back with recommendations and um, in addition to the council, for example, having to prepare for restructuring its courses of instruction as we were just discussing in sections five and six, but that those have uh, future deadlines. But right now the bill is drafted uh, on page eight, for example, that the new executive director of the council has to provide a verbal progress report on how that restructuring of those educational programs are going. That's a section eight. Um, and you had previously discussed in that section eight on page eight of um, extending out that report back to sometime in March. However, your feedback from the Senate committee was they wanted, um, they were hoping for progress reports early. Um, so for currently the change here, for example, on section eight, page eight, line 13 was to have a progress report back from the new executive director of the council on in January. Now that's the executive director himself or herself, not the full council. Um, but one of the things you were discussing is that the council was in the progress process of choosing a new executive director. However, if I forward on through the bill and if you keep scrolling um, through the bill. Madam Chair. Ah, uh, yes. Um, sorry. That in itself, to me, says that we've got to push some dates back because they haven't even selected an executive director yet. And, you know, it's, I would think it'd be very difficult for that executive director to come up with any sort of formal report if they're not even on the job yet. I believe the commissioner uh, said that they felt they would have an executive director on um, as early as October, I believe. Um, and it's somebody who remembers that conversation, correct me if I'm wrong. All right, nobody's jumping in with fresh I could say you're. I could say you're wrong, but I'm totally guessing. I'll stay on and just to point out the uh, other uh, requirements for a council report back. You can start to find those on page 18 in section, what's now section 16. This was the 10A as passed the Senate, but this was this is the section that requires various entities to report back to the GovOps committees with recommendations. And this language requires those entities to report back by January 15th. Your prior draft had an exception for the council to report back with a verbal progress report in March of next year, and then um, a follow-up final recommendations in April of next year. Um, but you did hear back from the Senate committee, again, about them wanting recommendations sooner rather than later. Um, so actually right now this language says that the council in, in section 16, the council would submit a verbal progress report to the GovOps committees by January and any recommendations for legislative action by March. And so those recommendations involve a variety of topics. Um, on page 19, there's uh, recommendations regarding officer qualifications and two officer training. And in six, body cam policy. And in seven, the military equipment recommendation. <clears throat> 
So that's a lot of uh, a lot of reports back that we are hoping to get started on before the middle of um, before the middle of the next legislative session. And uh, you know, I guess I would say that if we if we indeed want the newly constituted council to be um, to you know to be taking part in those, uh, we want them to be appointed uh, as soon as possible, um, so that they can begin having meetings on uh, on some of these really important issues. So, uh, Rob, your hand is up. You, you have something else on that? Sorry, Madam Chair. No, I didn't put it down. I'm sorry. You must be getting tired because it's been up there for a few minutes. Well, I always want to participate. I, I appreciate that about you. <clears throat> Committee discussion? Um, as Betsy Ann made note, um, and just to, to lay this all out there for, uh, for full disclosure on how, uh, on how we're deliberating on this, we, we have a very tight timeline with, uh, with the budget train leaving the station um, by the end of next week, uh, which means that if we find policy bills to be important, we need to have them moving um, in time with getting them across the line um, when the budget is passed and when we finally adjourn this 2020 marathon session. Um, and so to that end, we have been trying to keep track of the changes the Senate makes to our bills that they are working on, and they are keeping track of the changes that we make to their bills that we're working on. And this feedback that we, uh, that we got initially from the Senate committee after they looked at our, I think it was draft 2.1, is that right, Betsy Ann? Yeah. Uh, the feedback from them was that they, you know, they wanted these uh, these report backs at least to be um, verbally presented to us um, in January and uh, and during the legislative session next year. So, to me, that 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 necessitates that we try to get this council reconstituted as soon as possible, Jim. Question for Betsy again. Um, given the tight timeline, um, what happens if the uh, governor or other bodies miss that deadline uh, and a position is not appointed? I think that the council would be its full membership um, it, as it's supposed to be with that number of seats. And so I'll take a look at there, see if I can see any special quorum language. But if there's no special quorum language in their statute, then the standard quorum requirements is a majority of the full number. And one sec, actually the council, I'm looking at 20 VSA 2354. It says the council shall adopt rules as to quorum. Um, so we'd have to take a look at what their quorum rules are to see how they operate in that regard. Um, but the other statute I was thinking of is if there's no special quorum, it's in Title I. I'm pulling it up to state it specifically. I mean, typically a quorum would be a, a majority of the council, whether that's of the 24 or whether that's of those appointed. It's uh, a majority of the full number is required to take action, I believe is what that statute says. So 13. Yes. In this case. OK. Yes. No, but I'm just, I'm, what happens if the governor doesn't feel that he has to qualify candidates by November 15th in all positions or some of the other appointing 
bodies don't have a person? Do the existing people stay on um, or do, no, they don't. Okay, so Except everybody that is- trans That transitional provision that says um, in section 5A that says someone who get is gets to continue to serve under the revised membership can serve out the remainder of their term. So those people would get to stay on. If they're currently on now and they would just get reappointed um, under the new membership, they can continue to serve. Okay, but uh, I guess my point is um, the council doesn't cease to exist if a public member or any other appointed member uh, is vacant on November 15th. Is That's that correct? correct? That is correct. As long as we have 13 to make a quorum. Yes. Okay, thank you. That thank helps. You. Any other committee discussion on, on this? All right. Shall we move on? Okay. Thanks, Betsy Ann. All right, I'm scrolling. And so there, we're on page eight now. I think that we're still in the requirements for the council to restructure its training programs. Um, just on page eight, there's that flag of the transition to level two to level three. It's still in the as passed version, as passed Senate version of a July 1, 2021 deadline. So for the council to restructure its programs to transition from level two to level three without having to restart the certification pro process. Um, but moving on to section eight, um, this is the report back that we had discussed about the new executive director of the council providing a verbal progress report to the GovOps committees um, by January 15th on under A1, it's planned to replace some of its overnight law enforcement training required at the police academy and just adding in on lines 19 and 20 with specificity, including its 16 week residential basic training um, with all non overnight training and training in other areas of the state. Um, the including its 16 residential basic training um, was to emphasize I think that's according to the council testimony. I believe that's the only not over. I believe that's the only overnight training that the council requires at this time um, is the 16 week residential basic training. So just specifying that that's what the report would need to specifically address. And then I just noticed when looking at the language, um, whether they have to have a plan to replace their overnight training with, as the Senate pass version was, with non-overnight training in other areas of the state. Um, and I don't, I didn't know if that was the, uh, the requirement or what the General Assembly would be wanting them to actually have to replace their overnights with non-overnight in other areas, because it seems at least possible that they could allow um, their basic training to continue at the academy, but maybe not all parts of it have to be overnight, for example. So if that was, um, if it was the, um, the intent to allow them to consider replacing overnight training with non-overnight training, and it may be in other areas of the state, that language was added on line 20. Does that reflect what you're wanting them to address? John Gannon has his hand up on that topic, John. Thank you. Um, I, I know that the, the academy class that recently graduated that took part in the midst of the COVID-19 state of emergency that, that part of their training um, became virtual. Is that captured here, Betsy Ann, that, that virtual training could be conducted instead of in-person training, either at the academy or at another location in the state? I don't think the language clearly captures that. So if you did want to um, require them to think about that, um, you could do two things. On page seven, 
in lines two and three, you could, this is the statutory requirement for them to strive to offer non overnight courses whenever possible. You could add to statute there um, a reference to strive to offer remote, remote courses also, um, if you wanted to add that language there. And then in their section eight report back, you can have them specifically address remote training. Is, is that something, um, is that what you're hoping to hear back from them and to require of them? Oh, I oh, think it makes sense. Yeah, go ahead, John. Well, I think to encourage, you know, you know, that as many people as possible can get through um, the 16 week course or other training, um, you know, for the council to consider all forms of training, whether it's in person or remote um, would be important. I mean, obviously there's some forms of training, um, you know, such as, you know, use of force that, that probably needs to be in person. There may be other parts uh, of the training that don't need to be in person. Um, and to, to make it as flexible as possible so, so that single parents, uh, people who live in, you know, parts of the state that are not near the academy um, or other, you know, large locations can participate. I think it's important. Rob. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I, I agree with the intent from the member from Wilmington. There was just a part of it though, feels a little too prescriptive. It seems like that we're, we're kind of micromanaging here where those feel like the kind of decisions that the council would be making. But I, I, I do agree with the intent that we've got to make it as accessible um, as possible, but it, it just feels a little prescriptive to me. John. Thank you. Um, I didn't mean it to be prescriptive, um, just to ensure that the, the council was looking at all options um, for training. Um, so that they, you know, so they don't think we just mean, okay, it has to be at the police academy or some other location in Vermont um, that they could also consider remote. I, I did not mean it to be prescriptive at all yeah. that they had no, to and offer. I, and, and I do agree, agree with the intent, John, and, and maybe prescriptive wasn't the right word. I'm just, um, is there anything in this language that would prevent them from using that as an option for the training as it stands now? I don't believe so. Generally, just looking at the language, for example, if you go back up to their rulemaking requirement in section six on page six, they do have that requirement to adopt rules to identify and implement alternate routes to certification aside from the training provided at the academy. So that's a general requirement for them to uh, think about training, how to provide training outside of the academy. Um, and then on page seven, lines two and three, the language that they shall strive to offer non overnight courses whenever possible. Um, it would at least, I think that language would allow them to um, offer remote courses. If you wanted them to, <laughs> at least address this, um, perhaps you could ask them to uh, address it in their report back in section eight um, in that sub subdivision A1 language. John, go ahead. I think that makes sense, Betsy Ann. I mean, my, my goal was to give them as much flexibility in offering training as possible um, and not, you know, tie their hands as to it having to be in, in a physical location, whether that's at the academy at, or at some other thing. I want to encourage them to think of all manners of training um, as they move forward with, you know, sort of reinventing. Um, how, how they train law enforcement officers. 
Betsy Ann. So perhaps on page nine at the top, um, you can you can include language to say that um, the council shall specifically address how training may be provided remotely. Mm -hmm. Would that um, meet the intent of where you're wanting to go? Rob, how does that feel to you? Yeah, that, I, I like that. I mean, because I know that's what we're trying to get to. Makes sense. Thank you. John, that's good. Good for you. All right. JP's good. Warren's nodding. Excellent. Got it. Okay. So just a reminder on page nine, starting on line six, there's the language as passed Senate that there's that rulemaking deadline of July 1, 2023 for them to adopt the rules um, that identify and implement the alternate routes to certification. Section nine gets to that language about the council services um, being contingent on an agency's compliance with either the roadside stop data collection um, or the requirement to adopt, follow, or enforce any policy required under this chapter. There are a couple of them. And then you had already discussed the um, language on line 17 through 19 um, that also they would have to be in compliance with the current law requirement to report to the AG any law enforcement interaction in a mental health crisis that results in death or serious bodily injuries. And just a reminder at the top of page 10, the as passed Senate version would say that the council has to adopt procedures to enforce the requirements of this section which may allow for waivers for agencies under a plan to obtain compliance. I'll just keep moving on unless you want to stop me. Um, on page 10, section 10, here's that language in the as passed Senate version that um, there's nothing in the chapter prohibiting one agency um, providing additional training to its officers where no certification is requested or required and um, language in B uh, allowing an executive direct officer of one agency to seek certification from the council for any in-service training that that agency provides to officers of his or her own agency or another agency or both. This has been discussed before, it was in S-273. It's essentially a technical update because it's the law catching up with current practice. This is already happening where um, one agency can get certified to provide training to other officers of another agency. Questions on that? All right. Section 11 is that language requiring a, um, agency that is considering hiring an officer um, to have to reach out to the officer's current or former agency. Um, so this is already a requirement for a potential hiring agency to contact an officer's former agency if an officer is no longer employed at an agency to find out its reason why the officer is no longer employed there. The ads pass Senate version would add on to that, that a potential hiring agency would also have to contact the officer's current agency if the officer's still employed at an agency. So if an officer is still employed in an agency, the as passed Senate version would require the potential hiring agency to contact that current agency to obtain an analysis of the officer's performance there. And on page 11, line seven and eight, there's a duty to contact the former agency if an officer is not employed at an agency. So to contact the officer's last agency. What has to happen when that happens is that the potential hiring agency has to contact um, the agency, either the current or former one, to obtain a disclosure as to why the officer 
as to the officer's uh, performance or if they're at, currently employed or um, the reason the officer is no longer employed by the agency if they're no longer if they're not employed at one. As under current law, an officer who refuses to execute the written waiver that's required to get this analysis um, cannot be hired by the potential hiring agency. That's the current law as it applies now to the duty to contact a former agency. The language goes on to say that if we're talking about a current or former agency in this state, the executive officer of that agency shall disclose to the potential hiring agency in writing its analysis of the officer's performance at the agency, if they're still employed there, or the reason the officer is no longer employed by the agency as applicable. And the executive officer would have to send a copy of the disclosure to the officer at the same time the agency sends it to the potential hiring agency. I'm at the bottom of page 11, moving on to page 12. There's language um, partially already exists in current law that the um, agency who's reporting this information is immune from liability for its disclosure unless the disclosure would constitute intentional misrepresentation or gross negligence. On page 12, line four, the new language um, for today that uh, was mentioned in your previous meeting is that the potential hiring agency that receives a disclosure under subsection B shall keep the contents of that disclosure confidential. So while there's this requirement to do information sharing, um, the potential hiring, potential hiring agency will be learning about either an officer's performance at their current agency or the reason the officer is no longer employed at a former agency. Um, once the potential hiring agency receives that disclosure, the agency has to keep it confidential. So that's a new subsection C there on page 12. Line four. So committee discussion on this. Um, this is an attempt to make sure that there's um, disclosure between uh, hiring law enforcement agencies, but that confidential information is not made generally public. All right, nobody's diving for their hand. You already reviewed on page 12, line six, what's now subsection D. Um, this was the language you reviewed on the 15th, that a collective bargaining agreement between an agency, and I previously had an officer, but a CBA is not between an agency and an officer. It's between an agency and either the exclusive representative or bargaining agency of the officers. So it's just an updating terminology correction. But a CBA, um, cannot include a prohibition on the exchange of information between the employing agency and another agency about the officer's performance at the employing agency. So this was the language you had already discussed to say that moving forward, CBAs can't prohibit this exchange of information. Okay. Okay. Relatedly, section 12, um, provides transitional provisions essentially to explain how this will work in practice because there may be agreements now that conflict with those new requirements um, for disclosing information. Subsection A was the language that uh, passed the Senate, um, except I just added in the specifics uh, subsections that are being addressed on line 14. So that's why A and B are highlighted. But as a reminder, the language as passed the Senate was that the requirement of a current agency to disclose its analysis of its officer's performance at the agency, as addressed above in subsections A and B, shall not apply if there's a binding non-disclosure agreement prohibiting that disclosure that was executed prior to the effective date of that section. So it's just belts and suspenders language to not interfere with any contractual agreement then in effect. Subsection B, you already reviewed it on the 15th, but I just updated the su new subsection designation. It was C there instead of D, so I just flagged that. But this is saying that the provisions in 
subsection D above in section 11 that prohibit a collective bargaining agreement from including a prohibition on the exchange of info between agencies about the performance of an officer shall not apply to any CBA that took effect prior to the effective date of that section, but shall apply upon the expiration or termination of such an agreement and apply to any CBA that takes effect on and after the effective date of this section. I'm moving on to page 13. In section 13, you already reviewed this language. Um, this language would change it to be the council that comes up with a model body camera policy. The as passed Senate version would have said that the LEAB has the authority to establish a model body camera policy pursuant to the authority the General Assembly already gave them in 2016. Big picture, this uh, section is saying that beginning on January 1, 2022, each agency that authorizes its officers to use body cameras shall adopt, follow, and enforce now a model body camera policy established by the council, and each officer who uses a body camera shall comply with the provisions of that policy. And under B, the council would be required to incorporate the provisions into its training. John Gannon. Thank you. Um, Betsy Ann, um, is this language consistent with S219? So S219, there was, um, I had flagged it in the prior draft. I was getting rid of some of my notes in here because it was looking so cluttered. Right. Um, in S219, you did have, I believe in section seven, the requirement for all Department of Public Safety law enforcement officers to use body cameras. And the language in your section one provided that the General Assembly was committing to reviewing uh, the, the standards right. for model body camera policy uh, use yep. um, before that DPS requirement took effect, which I think is October 1, 2020. Um, so as it currently stands right now, if that DPS requirement to use body cams is the effective date of that is not extended beyond October 1st. There's currently not a requirement for that use to be in accordance with any specific policy. Although I, I think DPS is looking at a body camera policy, but I don't know the status of that. Um, but as this, if this language were to pass as currently presented, um, the council would need to come up with a policy and then beginning on January 1, 2022, any law enforcement agency, which would include DPS, um, so, would have to um, follow the council model policy. Just given that DPS is rolling up body cams as we speak, I think that's what they're doing. Um, should we just say that um, law enforcement agencies should comply with the model body worn camera policy established by the law enforcement advisory board uh, until um, January 1st, 2022, just so that there is a policy in place. You could do that. Yes. And that would uh, apply to DPS. Um, we haven't gotten into the specifics really delved into what that model body cam policy is from 2016, un unless you have done it elsewhere. Um, no, that was I, mean, I just would prefer that there is some policy rather than no policy at all. Yes. Would you like me to add that? That makes sense, committee. Does that seem reasonable? It's a good catch. Thanks, John. So it would require any law enforcement agency um, that authorizes its officers to use body cameras to follow the LEAB policy until the January 1, 2022. 
Got it. I am moving on to section 14. This is the language you reviewed before about prohibiting the use of facial recognition technology. The prior draft used also uh, biometric matching, um, but that could include other things. It could include things like fingerprinting. So this new revised language would focus specifically on facial recognition technology and prohibit an officer from using facial recognition technology or information acquired through the use of facial recognition technology unless the use would be permitted with respect to drones under a provision of current law in 20 VSA 4622 that does allow the use of facial recognition technology on drones in certain circumstances, such as when it is being used uh, as authorized by warrant or for um, non-crime -in investigative reasons, such as search and rescue. However, there are other limitations on the use of um, drones and facial recognition technology, such as when um, people are uh, exercising their right to protest. And that is set forth in 20 VSA 4622. Um, speaking with our judiciary attorneys, there is a definition provided of facial recognition technology. This was based on prior research that was conducted in this area. This facial recognition technology, um, facial recognition itself would be defined as um, automated or semi-automated process that identifies or attempts to identify a person based on the characteristics of the person's face, including identification of known or unknown persons or groups, or the automated or semi-automated process by which the characteristics of a person's face are analyzed to determine the person's sentiment, state of mind, or other propensities, including the person's level of dangerousness. And then facial recognition technology would mean computer software or application that performs facial recognition. Jim Harrison has a question. Thank you. Um, Betsy Ann, is there any prohibition on using facial recognition in the case of a kidnapping, um, whether it's an adult or a child that's been kidnapped, can law enforcement use facial recognition, whether it's in a mall or downtown area where there might be a crowd of people and they're trying to use surveillance cameras to pinpoint um, the victim? As currently written, this would only allow that facial recognition technology if it is being used on a drone um, as authorized under the drone law. And so a drone might be the drone might be hard to use in a mall, I guess, without being pretty obvious. Um, okay. Uh, Whatever. I don't know the answer to it. I don't know how big a deal it is, but um, gosh, if I had a child kidnapped, I would want to use every tool at my disposal. Um, so just a just concern. Any other committee questions before we move on? Committee discussion on that? Mike? Um, just to share a little bit about what was just mentioned, it would be a horrible event if somebody were kidnapped, but the reality is uh, most child abductions are done by family members, 95%. So stranger danger 
is not the problem here. It's usually within the families and I'm not so sure facial recognition software would be needed or um, as much of a help as we might think it might be if it's somebody in immediate family that's already done this. All right, I think we are ready to move on. Come on what's now called section 15 on page 14, line 12. Um, just one change is on line 12 is uh, limiting training from the council's title. Otherwise, you've already, we've already discussed removing this uh, language that would change the definition of category B conduct because you have already addressed it in S219, which was enacted in the law. And so that language would be eliminated from the bill. And on page 16, you'd move on to the topic of when officers, when agencies have to report alleged unprofessional conduct to the council. And in regard to category B conduct, which is essentially professional misconduct and includes a defined list, um, the language at the top of page 17 is that the agency has to report that allegation to the council um, when it's a credible complaint against an officer, which is a, would be a change from the current law, which is um, they when the agency would have to report it to the council if it's deemed credible by the executive officer after the agency already goes through its whole investigative, valid investigative process. At the bottom of page uh, 17, there's that new language as passed the Senate on line 19, that the council would provide a copy of any report it receives and relevant documents, the investigative report that the agency puts together to the council advisory committee um, which would be required to recommend any appropriate action to take in regard to an officer who is the subject of that report. The Council Advisory Committee is a five member entity um, appointed by the governor with four members who don't have a law enforcement officer, law enforcement connection and one retired law enforcement officer. So that takes us out of the council chapter. And we get into this recommendation section. So section 16 is a report back from various entities with recommendations for um, to the General Assembly, particularly the GovOps committees on um, issues relating to law enforcement. The language as passed the Senate was um, that these entities need to report by January 15th um, but there, as we discussed a little earlier this morning, there would be the exception for the council that they could, they shall submit a verbal progress report to the GovOps committees by that date, meaning January 15th, and then any recommendations for legislative action on or before March 15th, um, just to build out more time for the new council. Uh, so as a reminder of what those topics are, there's the first topic is law enforcement officer qualifications. And here the LEAB would be reporting about uh, interviewing and hiring officers and standards for doing so and recognizing qualities that are desirable and specifically recommending standards for officers who serve in a supervisory role. I'm at the top of page 19, um, the council it's already defined, so that's why that language is being struck there on line one. Would be required to consult with the Human Rights Commission, ACLU. You discussed the other day adding statewide racial justice groups. Um, just an update on terminology uh, in regard to statewide groups re representing individuals with lived experience of a mental health condition or psychiatric disability. The prior draft used similar language. It was based on the Mental Health Crisis Response Commission statute, which was enacted in 2017, I believe. So I based the terminology on that statute. Um, this is in regard to respectful language. The General Assembly in, I think, 2014 made a firm statement in updating its statutes to re use respectful language when referring to people. Um, it's a people first requirement. 
we're talking about individuals. And then if a person has a disability, you refer to a person with, an, uh, with a disability. Um, the language that is uh, just updating is uh, to reflect the most recent terminology that I understand people in the peer community would like to use when referring to themselves. And I checked with our human services attorney in updating this language. So you'll see in a couple places, it's individuals with lived experience of a mental health condition or psychiatric disability. So I'm just flagging why I updated that terminology. Otherwise, this language doesn't change. Um, council would have to consult with those groups and other relevant organizations and individuals in reviewing officers, officer applicants' current written, oral, and psychological exams for cultural sensitivities and overall appropriateness. The second recommendation is regard to law enforcement training. The council here would have to consult with the racial disparities in the criminal justice, criminal and juvenile justice system advisory panel, Human Rights Commission, ACLU, statewide racial justice groups, statewide groups representing individuals with lived experience of a mental health condition or psychiatric disability, and other relevant stakeholders shall review the current requirements for basic and annual in-service training in order to determine whether appropriate training is provided in the areas of cultural awareness, implicit bias, de-escalation, and recognition of and appropriately responding to individuals with a mental health condition. I'm just going to add health in there because I think that's the appropriate term on line 17. And whether that training is embedded in a training in other policing policies, such as traffic stops and searches. And then it goes on to say, after considering that analysis and in reviewing the current training requirements and how that training is used in practice, the council would recommend any amendments to that statutorily required training that might not be necessary for all officers. The statute does control some of the training that must be uh, obtained and in some cases, the number of hours. Page 20, line three, the council, LEAB, and DPS would have to consult with the VLCT and other interest stakeholders to determine whether, now two things, the council should be reestablished within a state agency or other oversight entity, and whether there should be more flexibility in the residential and field training required of law enforcement applicants, including whether applicants should be able to satisfy some aspects of basic training through experiential learning specifically eliminating the uh, language on lines eight and nine about whether the police academy should be re relocated to a different area of the state. And you had reviewed that the other day. Third topic is models of civilian oversight. Here the AG would be consulting with the Council of Human Rights Commission, VLCT, Vermont Law School Center for Justice Reform. We discussed that the other day. Um, statewide ra racial justice groups, statewide groups representing individuals with lived experience of a mental health condition or psychiatric disability, and other interested parties to recommend one or more models of civilian oversight. Fourth topic, page 21, is in regard to reporting allegations of officer misconduct. Here, again, the AG's office would consult with the Council, Human Rights Commission, ACLU, statewide racial justice groups, statewide groups representing individuals with lived experience of mental health condition or psychiatric disability, and other interested parties in order to identify a central port point for reporting allegations of officer misconduct, which may be the council or another entity, and how to handle those allegations. Fifth topic is access to complaint information. Here, the council advisory committee, that subgroup, would be required to consult with the Secretary of State, Human Rights Commission, ACLU, and other interested parties in reviewing public access to records related to allegation of officer misconduct and substantiations in order to recommend any changes to current practice. Jim, I'm sorry, guy. Sorry. Um, just a comment as, as we're rereading some of these sections and some of the new wording that's been added in, I agree with the inclusionary tone of all these various um, uh, initiatives and reporting and whatnot. I, a word of caution, we're making this very bureaucratic and I really question whether, you know, if you consult with 20 people 
each time you want to do something, are we really setting up roadblocks to getting to the end result? Uh, just a comment, and it may be, again, the minority of one that worries about the bureaucracy that we're building into each step that we're trying to take. So. Committee discussion. All right, number six. Number six is body cams. Discuss the substitution of the council um, being required to recommend a model body camera policy for use by agencies and officers. Um, if you're gonna have that new section requiring all agencies to follow the LEAB policy until the council is required to adopt its new, the new one on January 1st, 22. Do you wanna maintain the language about the LEAB reporting any changes it deems necessary to its current body cam model policy established pursuant to 2016 legislation? Committee discussion on that. And John, do you have a thought? <laughs> Go ahead. Thank you. Um, is there a date for this report or uh, I'm just. LEAB, um, if you kept that in there, they'd have to provide a progress. They have to, uh, let's see the language in, in the introduction of section 16 is a report to the GovOps committees by January 15th on the progress in regard to the following topics, including any recommendations for legislative action. Okay, so, so the council would be updating us on the progress, correct? In this case for body cams, um, this would be a new requirement earlier in the bill for the council to establish a model body cam policy. Yeah, yeah, no, no, I get that. I'm just, I really want the dates of when this has to oh, be done. So the council would have to establish its new model body camera policy by January 1, 22. Okay, so, all right. Um, so, I mean, this bill will probably come effective, what, October 1st, let's say, 2020. So that, that would only have the current LEAB policy in effect for um, October, November, three months, right? Um, A over. The, well, right now the body cam language earlier in the bill, and I will, make, let's go back to it to review it with certainty. That is on page 13, section 13. It says essentially beginning January 1, 2022, each agency that authorizes its officers to use body cams uh, shall follow the council's model body camera policy. So in theory, that's, that's giving the council until January 1, 22 to come up with a model body camera policy as I read it. Well, okay, so I mean, so there's three months between when this bill will uh, likely become law and when the council um, will hopefully have a body camera policy. So, I mean, for me, I don't like, I mean, there's a lot of reports in this. So I, I'm not sure the LAAB needs to come back to us in, in the next three months with respect to any changes they make, given that we're going to hopefully have a new policy in January. But that's just my thoughts. Did you say January 22? Yes. Oh, oh. I so take it's all a that back. year. No, I take the that year back. and three Sorry. months. Big mistake. Sorry. Forget what I said. <laughs> so 
So in the case of it being a year and three months, you think a report back would be in order? Yes. And I, I apologize. My mind's half on this bill and half on uh, what I have to do this afternoon. So. <laughs> I can only imagine. Marsha Gardner. Just out of curiosity, did the uh, governor's executive order give uh, the commissioner of DPS a, a specific timeline for recommending a body cam policy? Let's look. I know the overall recommendation is for DPS to recommend a model body cam policy to the council. Um, so I'm pulling up the executive order. Body cams are in section D on page two. It doesn't give a, it doesn't give a, uh, Deadline, it just says the commissioner of DPS is to, to develop for consideration of the council a statewide model policy on body warm cameras. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, John. So I, I think actually our language now is more consistent with the executive order because we're asking the, the council to develop the policy. I think that's good. So I guess the issue like you had discussed earlier that um, you're contending with is that DPS is gonna be required to have body cams for all of its officers. And um, you had already discussed earlier in the bill saying any agency that uses a body cam shall follow the LEABs until the council's deadline to have one on January 1, 22. And so the, yeah, the lingering question, am I, am I hearing where the discussion is going is that you would wanna maintain the requirement for the LEAB to report any changes it deems necessary to its current model body cam policy that it established pursuant to the 2016 requirement? I believe so. <clears throat> committee members want to ask any questions about that, express yay or nay. I'm not seeing anyone diving in. All right, I will add that language back in but still maintain the requirement for the council to recommend a model policy since that will be a requirement beginning on January 1, 22. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Top of page 22, um, after consulting with Secretary of State, Human Rights Commission, ACLU, statewide racial justice groups, statewide groups representing individuals with lived experience of a mental health condition or psychiatric disability, and other parties, it would be the council would specifically recommend policies for responding to public records requests for body cam footage, including any recommended timelines to respond, how and what footage should be redacted, length of footage retention and storage. And then as you had already reviewed, DPS would be required to consult with the council and the LEAB to investigate the possibility of a statewide group purchasing contract for body cams and central storage locations. And if DPS recommends such a group, it would detail its recommended structure and operation. And then finally, the last topic is military equipment. You discussed the other day that after an opportunity for community involvement and feedback, the council would recommend a statewide policy on officers acquisition of military equipment this would change the as past Senate version, which would require the LEAB to recommend one about officers' use of it. Okay. All right. I'm going to move on to the next topic, which is state data collection and analysis. You had reviewed this language the other day about the GAC um, being required to approve population level indicators 
um, demonstrating quality of life for Vermonters who are BIPOC. To review again, the language on page 23 would say on or before March 1 next year, GAC would consult with the Executive Director of Racial Equity, Social Equity Caucus, and the CPO, and shall accept recommendations from other relevant entities in order to approve by that date population level indicators that demonstrate the quality of life for Vermonters who are Black, Indigenous, or people of color as those indicators relate to the current law population level quality of life outcomes set forth in 3VSA 2311B. And Jim those... Harrison has his hand up. Okay, um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I guess we're continuing our theme of, of soliciting uh, advice from a, consulting with a whole bunch of groups, but I, I, maybe I missed it. Why, why are we assigning this to a legislative committee, uh, the Government Accounting Committee? Um, and then secondly, why, you know, why not any, I mean, any legislator can, I guess, interject thoughts or opinions on most anything. I don't know why we have to signal out a caucus group that self-selected to do that. Um, so a couple ramblings uh, on the same topic, sorry. I can address the first question um, just as regard to procedure. So statute, you can actually see it in the next section. Um, statute currently gives GAC the authority to accept recommendations for revisions to the indicators and then to approve indicators. And once approved, the chief performance officer has to report on those indicators in the state outcomes report. The statute actually is included in the next section, which is new. But if you do want to look, take a look at that current law language, it appears at the top of page 25, um, where current law provides that annually by March 1st, a standing committee of the General Assembly, having jurisdiction over a population level quality of life outcome, or the chief performance officer may submit to the GAC a request that an indicator for that outcome be revised. And if GAC approves it, the chief performance officer shall revise and report on that indicator um, in accordance with that approval. And the reporting of indicators is in the state outcomes report. So that is just addressing the um, current law process for uh, allowing GAC to approve the indicators that are reported on. The rest of your question is a policy discussion. Okay, thank you. John Gannon. So, Qu question, Betsy Ann. Um, is, is there any other legislative caucus that that you're aware of that um, is consulted with in legislation? Not that I'm aware of offhand. So I, I well, I understand um, why this was included, I am concerned about the precedent we may be setting here. Um, because as we know, there are a number of legislative caucuses and they continue to grow almost weekly now. Um, I am concerned about all of a sudden inserting um, legislators in, into the middle of this process, um, given that ultimately, um, you know, you know, I just think it, it'll, I'm just really concerned about setting that precedent, um, unless this is something we commonly do. Um, um, especially, you know, how is that, you know, if you have, you know, people from the social equity caucus in there with, you know, the chief performance officer, um, that, that may weigh in how decisions are made. So I, I do share Jim's concerns here um, because it is establishing a precedent. Um, and I just don't want to all of a sudden see a lot of legislation um, where you know, you know, different groups are supposed to consult with different legislative caucuses. Um, it, it's just very. Um, Other committee discussion. Rob Leclaire. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I have to agree with, with John. I, it, 
I'm very uncomfortable about this. It, it just seems now that we're going to give a certain group of legislators, um, or give you like a second bite of the apple here. And now all of a sudden, are we going to be somehow addressing legislation, but just in a very, very different manner? Um, and because we don't have this process in any other place, I, I can't really support it here either. Mike Merwicki. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I do support this and, and we are in changing times and setting changing precedents. I'm not sure if this is a good analogy, but um, policies of affirmative action for many years were very controversial. Uh, for some people, it signified leveling the playing field. For others, it, it signified uh, an unlevel playing field where uh, they felt certain groups were being, being given special considerations. And um, I think we're in a similar time where we're trying to look at the present and the future uh, through the lens of trying to uh, right some wrongs and some of them that have been gone on in this country for 400 years. Um, I'm not sure if this is, as I said, directly analogous to affirmative action, but I, I believe uh, while this is a change from precedent, these are times we were in that deserve a change from the status quo to do things a little differently. Bob Hooper. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, two things on line five, I noticed yesterday the word accept there is that received is that implement that seems like a weird word choice but more to the point i was under the impression that the caucuses like i'm a member of the labor working vermonters caucus and the social equity caucus and both of those have membership quote unquote that is beyond the scope of just legislators uh, is that just uh my impression or what constitutes a caucus, I guess, is the question. Who That's are, a good question. Um, who, are, who are we including? I don't know. I mean, there's a number of different caucuses that, um, that operate. So it's hard to know exactly how each caucus considers its membership. Hal, did you want to weigh in on that? Yeah, I just want to point of clarification, yes, the, the Social Equity Caucus does include about 75 community members as well as about 75 legislators. As does the Labor Caucus, so, you know, probably a, a balance. So we have, um, we have folks in the committee falling on both sides of this discussion. And I think we ought to straw poll the question of whether to keep in the requirement that the Government Accountability Committee consult with the Social Equity Caucus, um, since we seem to have a difference of opinion on this. Um, any other committee discussion on this question? All right, if you, um, if you would sh give me a thumbs up if you believe that the Social Equity Caucus language on line five should stay in the bill. So thumbs up if you think the language should stay in the bill. One, two, three, four, five, six. If you believe the language, uh, wait a minute, did I get all of those? If you, Stay in, if you're a stay in, I think one, two, three, four, five, six, okay. <clears throat> if you believe that language should come out, please raise your thumb. One, two, three, four. Six and four is 10, wait a minute. Did I miss a thumb? <laughs> two, three, four. We'll take the missing one, that's okay. Okay. Are you going to sing Where's Thumpkin? 
Could have been a finger. So with the missing vote, that would be, uh, did I count my thumb? I don't know if I counted my thumb. I thought I counted my thumb. Maybe um, we should do it again, Madam Chair. All right. If you would like to leave in the reference to GAC consulting with the Social Equity Caucus, give me a really big thumbs up. One, two, three, four, five, six. All right. If you believe um, Bob Hooper's not in his chair right now. <laughs> if you believe that language should be removed, please raise your thumb right up to the camera. One, two, three, four, and Rob's thumb makes five, so that's the missing vote. Um, it looks like a slight majority of the committee is interested in leaving that language in there. So thank you for thank you for trying to vote twice, Rob. <laughs> Are we ready to move along? Marsha. You are muted. There we go. I have only one device, so I have to scroll between Zoom and the, um, the bill. Uh, I have a question about the military equipment. And okay. when it says acquisition, Betsy Ann, does that include uh, grants? Um, sometimes the federal government has grants for equipment. I know Liquor Control received a grant for a certain type of long gun. Uh, would acquisition include that? Likely, because I think it's getting at what type of military equipment agencies can acquire and then use. Um, so yeah, if it's a so if it's an open-ended grant, um, I think this model policy would um, describe what could be obtained through that grant. If it's a grant for a specific kind of equipment and this model policy would allow it, then that would be okay. But if the policy would not per permit it, then an agency wouldn't be able to use that grant authority to acquire it. Thank you. John Gannon. Um, just on military equipment, um, you know, I would expect that as um, the council develops a policy with respect to the acquisition of military equipment. Part, part of that policy is defining what is military equipment. Um, because we know um, based, based on, I know by looking at an Excel spreadsheet of surplus military equipment that has come within the state, you know, uh, some of it is, you know, I would not consider military equipment at all, such as pickup trucks, um, you know, forklifts. Um, whereas some other things um, like mine vehicles, uh, you know, I would definitely consider um, military equipment. But I think part of the, the council's re responsibility here is to, to define what is military equipment and what, you know, um, law enforcement agencies within the state should or should not acquire um, based on some definition. Anything else on military equipment before we jump back to section 17 and 18? All right, go ahead, Betsy Ann. I think we got through 17 with GAC approving indicators and they will be reported on in the next state outcomes report that comes out in September, end of September. That'll be for next year. Um, section 18 was um, mentioned when the executive director of racial equity was testifying in regard to the indicators and there was further um, discussion about um, the better or describing the point of collecting outcomes or collecting indicators to measure the state's progress in reaching our outcomes. 
so this section 18 is in response to that request. It would actually amend the state outcomes report statute, um, which is in 3 VSA 2311. Uh, this requires the chief performance officer, the CPO, to annually by September 30th, submit to the General Assembly the state outcomes report that demonstrates the state progress in reaching the outcomes of Vermont's quality of life that are already established in law by providing data for the population level indicators that GAC approves. So you've already, that's a current law language. You've already got your outcomes that are set forth in subsection B, which are shown on page 24, line eight. The, what was proposed is this new language here on page 24, line three, to further explain the purpose of having state outcomes and measuring, using indicators to measure our state's progress in reaching the outcomes. And this language um, would provide that Vermont's population level quality of life outcomes are intended to reflect the well being of all Vermonters and indicators reported to measure the extent to which outcomes are achieved are intended to represent the experience of all Vermonters, including and especially Vermonters who are members of marginalized groups. With the IB idea, as I can try to explain and as I understand it, is that these outcomes that are set forth in current law are the goals that the General Assembly is established for our state. We have a prosperous economy, we're healthy, our environment's clean and sustainable. Vermont is a safe place to live, et cetera. So those are the outcomes that apply to all of Vermonters. And then you use the indicator data to measure the state's progress in reaching those outcomes. And what this language in A2 is essentially getting at is that if a person is not in a marginalized group, one or more of them, um, they're probably more likely to be healthy and safe um, and living with dignity in settings that they prefer. Whereas people who might be in more than one, one or more marginalized groups are more likely to be the Vermonters who are showing up as the outliers in our indicator data. And so that is why there's that language there um, into saying that the outcomes are intended to reflect the well-being of all of Vermont and the indicators reported to measure the extent to which those outcomes are achieved are intended to re represent the experience of all Vermonters, including and especially those who are members of marginalized groups. Questions from committee? All right. <clears throat> Thank you. I am moving on then to page 25, line 11. This is the section, now section 19. Um, this would amend the language that you already passed in S219, which provides big picture that grants are only available to law enforcement agencies if they're complying with the race data reporting requirements that are set out in current law. Um, you've already discussed adding uh, Representative Donahue's proposed language that grants would also be contingent on an agency reporting death or serious bodily injury um, when an officer is involved in a mental health crisis response. And then I just happened, I, I think I discussed this the other day with you in that looking at that uh, language that you enacted in S219, it appeared to refer only to a local law enforcement agency there on line 15. And uh, my understanding from speaking with you is that you intended for, or you want that um, grant contingency to be applicable to any law enforcement agency, not just our local ones, which I would read to be our municipal police. And so the update to this section would be to strike local preceding law enforcement agency on line 15. Makes sense. Is that where you wanted to go with that? <clears throat> I, I believe that was our intent and our discussion. Anybody wanna jump in with a different thought? 
All right. Okay, um, page 26, section 20, um, that reader assistance heading on line one is just being eliminated because you already had the more general description of this portion of the bill, state data collection and analysis. But this is the VCIC requirement in line two in the new subdivision two um, to require VCIC to come up with definitions that all agencies have to use when entering data into their system of records. And every age officer would have to use those definitions when entering crime data into their agency system, which might be Valcor or Spillman. And the language that you considered adding um, from the other day appears on line 19 that when BCIC comes up with these definitions, it would be in consultation with the crime research group, statewide racial justice groups, and statewide groups representing individuals with lived experience of a mental health condition or psychiatric disability. Rob. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I am using one device as well, and I apologize. Can you tell me what version you're working on from Betsy Ann? I had it, and then I flipped screens and lost it, and I can't oh, yeah. find it again. I am I'm on, sorry. It's, no, it's a draft 3.1. It's the annotated version with all the colors. Three. Draft 3.1. Okay, thank you. I'm sorry. Thank no. you. Yeah. All right, I'm going to move on then. Um, page 27, we've got the LEAB. Section 21 is repealing it where it currently lives in law, not the right place, moving it to where it should be in law, which is under the Department of Public Safety because it is and it was created within the Department of Public Safety. Um, to advise the commissioner, the governor, and the General Assembly on issues involving the cooperation and coordination of all agencies that exercise law enforcement responsibilities. There will be no changes to this. You haven't discussed any from the version as passed the Senate, but big picture, the Senate um, would add several members to the LEAB. Uh, the chief of the Capitol Police is one. Uh, the... Uh, law enforcement officer appointed by the president of the VSEA. And I keep forgetting to pull it up, but it's in the summary. I looked at it the other day. There were two other ones that the Senate would propose adding to the current membership of this advisory council. I wanna say it's uh, related to fish and wildlife and motor vehicles because they don't currently have a specific seat. Mm -hmm. But otherwise, the only change to this would be the um, updating amendment to the name of the Criminal Justice Training Council on page 28. Um, so now it's just the Criminal Justice Council on line 15. The only other changes to this LEAB statute, even though it's getting, because it's getting deleted one place and put in another uh, place, is just to update the quorum in um, acknowledgement of the new members that would be added. So, but no change to that from as past the Senate. Page 30 is the recodification directive. Basically, um, any references to the where it used to live in statute would be deemed to mean its new place where it's supposed to be. And then section 24 um, would require it to uh, report in 21 on the ways towns can increase access to law enforcement services. Uh, we have just a little bit of time before we're supposed to go over to House of Probes. Madam Chair, I'm going to go over to dispatch because this was one of the last substantive portions of your bill. Um, I think in reviewing what the approach agenda says this morning, and Andrea can correct me if I'm wrong, um, approach was uh, expecting us at 1130 instead of 11, but we should probably double check on that. So as not to keep them waiting, I would love to think we could finish our uh, our walkthrough of the annotated version before um, before we break for an appropriations visit. So um, Andrea will contact Teresa and just make sure that we know how much time we have. That sounds good. Okay, so two changes that would be happening in this dispatch portion. Um, first, getting rid of the Senate language that said the commissioner of DPS would adopt the rules that set forth the rates for dispatch functions. Um, what, in addition, this would do is eliminate the current law language in the annotated version 
on page 31, starting on line eight, that says that DPS has authority to establish charges sufficient to recover the cost of dispatching and that dispatch positions that are fully funded under those contracts may be authorized under the provisions of 32 VSA 1035B. Um, so this would strike from statute that current charging authority and with the idea that you would eliminate that authority until the General Assembly is the one to establish the fee structure. We'll just jump ahead to the language that I currently had um, based on, it was my understanding that there were there, they were charging under some contractual agreements. Um, and with direction from the chair, the idea was to allow them to continue to charge under their current contracts, but not charge more and allow them to charge less, but not to allow them to charge anybody else any new fees under any contractual arrangements until the General Assembly establishes a fee structure. But we just heard from Nolan this morning that, um, and DPS confirmed that they're not currently charging um, under any contracts. So it seems like if that's the case, you don't need this new language, at least part of it on page 34. Because right now this, this would be a session law temporary provision that says, notwithstanding the provisions of 20 VSA 1871I as amended by section 25 of this act, which removed the charging authority, this language would say DPS may continue to charge fees under the provisions of any contractual arrangements in effect on the effective date of that section that it has to perform dispatch. It can have authorized under the provisions of 32 VSA 5B dispatch positions that are fully funded under those contracts and can renew those contracts with fees at the same or lower amount. It's sounding like if they're not charging any fees now, you can get rid of that language. Um, and if you want to just say they shall not charge fees, you can just keep the language that begins on line 11 that says, the department shall not charge fees in any contractual arrangements it enters into to perform dispatching functions until the General Assembly establishes in law a dispatch fee structure for those charges. Does committee feel comfortable with, uh, with eliminating this language? Um, I, I wanted that to go in just to make sure that we weren't inadvertently um, uh, handcuffing DPS in any way while we wait for them to resolve this issue of how to equitably fund dispatch services, um, but it sounds like that may have been unnecessary. So are we good with removing this? All right. I'll do that for the next draft. but maintain the prohibition that they shall not charge fees or any contractual arrangements to perform dispatch until the General Assembly establishes in law a dispatch fee structure. So it'd be a moratorium until there's further legislative action to set what those fees can be. Um, but this statute does, or this sex section goes on to say that by now March 15th of next year, DPS would be required to hold at least th three public hearings and consult with VLCT, the EMS uh, Advisory Committee, uh, Vermont Police Chiefs Association, the State Firefighters Association, and local EMS police and fire agencies in order to report by that date, March 15th, to the GovOps Committees, House Ways and Means, and Senate Finance, the department's recommendations for an equitable dispatch fee structure for the department to charge for dispatching EMS, police, fire, and fire, and potential funding mechanisms for those charges that don't rely on property taxes. And additionally, new language would say that if the department, after as it's going through this process of holding hearings and taking, taking, um, uh, consulting with those listed groups. If DPS decides to overrule substantial arguments and considerations raised against the equitable dispatch fee structure or potential funding mechanisms it ultimately recommends, DPS would need to include in its report a description of those arguments and considerations 
and the reasons for the department's decision and overruling them. Essentially, so the department would have to describe um, what counter arguments were um, uh, in lieu of what their fee proposed fee structure is and why they did not choose to pursue those recommendations. Thanks, Betsy. And I, I think that's probably very helpful for, uh, for the purposes of the legislature um, understanding all of the perspectives in this complicated landscape. Can you remind me, the Vermont State Firefighters Association, is that a group that would represent not only um, volunteer fire, fire agencies, but also the professional firefighters? I'm actually, I can't answer with certainty. The State Firefighters Association, when looking for a firefighters group to um, provide advice, they're listed in the Fire Training Service Council um, makeup. They have a website. Um, but I, I don't, I, I can't, I don't know right offhand exactly who all is, uh, who all they represent. I'm, I'm looking it up right now. Yeah, I, I appreciate taking a moment to, to just take a peek at this. We wanna make sure that our um, smaller towns that rely on mainly volunteer um, firefighters are, uh, are being given a seat at the table to talk about how dispatch works. And I know that um, oftentimes when, when I attend town meeting at my three town meetings, um, there are long discussions about the line items that relate to the fire department. And, um, and I think we just wanna make sure that we're not setting up a scenario where the creation of some dispatch fees in the future um, means that the firefighters themselves see a smaller appropriation from their town because it hits the it hits that line item in the very tight town budget. It does look like it has a uh, rural focus. Do you want me to do share screen right now on their website? Yeah, let's get Andrea to make you a co-host so you can share screen. Go ahead. Thanks, Andrea. Okay. So if you can see that, okay, here is their website and they do mention um, let's see. This one sentence that I was looking at, the association continues to work hard to identify and address the needs of firefighters in Vermont's rural fire departments. Um, they discuss having a diverse membership. Support 236 fire departments throughout the state. That, that sounds like a fair representation. <laughs> yeah, and it, I, I, that was one of the reasons it, it did appear that they were, it says support the 236 fire departments throughout Vermont as if, you know, it sounds like they rep, um, intended to represent all of them. Um, I was looking at some of the other, uh, it also mentions that it's one of the oldest firefighters organizations in the country. Um, and it's been around in Vermont since the mid 1800s. I looked at the Vermont uh, Fire Service Training Council and there are other firefighting entities, but um, they do appear, there was at least one called the Professional Firefighters Association. There's a Career Firefighters Association and those I inferred were not um, more in tune to the volunteers. Um, okay. So this one looked more universal, mm -hmm. but I, I'm not, um, completely familiar with them in practice. Okay. Committee feel good about that. Um, the makeup of this group to consult being fairly representative of the different interests in setting dispatch fees in the future. All right. 
Right. Um, Andrea has uh, heard back from Teresa and 1130 is better for us to visit appropriations. And so let's see if we can get through this annotated version of the bill and uh, take a brief bio break before 1130. That sounds good. Okay, so now the bill moves into EMS and there's really been no, there's been no changes that you've discussed here. Just as a reminder, what's first going on um, on page 36 is substituting the Department of Health for the State Board of Health as the entity that gets to divide the state into EMS districts and um, uh, recording those districts. I'm scrolling ahead. Um, just more substitution of the Department of Health for the State Board of Health as to making recommendations about EMS districts. A more substantive provision on page 37 is in regard to uh, qualifications for getting an ambulance license, like so for an ambulance service. Um, and this is language of the Senate was considering about um, ambulance services having to provide their services in a non-discriminatory manner. Um, so in order, this language provides on page 37, line 20, in order to obtain and maintain a license, an ambulance service shall be required to provide its services in a manner that does not discriminate on the basis of income, funding source, or severity of health needs in order to ensure access to ambulance services within the licensee's service area and Department of Health would be required to adopt rules on um, that provision. Senate heard about this issue um, from uh, Mr. Drew Hazelton, from who's on the EMS Advisory Committee and leads an EMS ambulance service um, about some of the ambulance services that have been able to get a license. And it's essentially uh, just a very, uh, good license to get because they're just working for um, certain uh, hospitals, for example. And so it was having an impact on other ambulance services in their area, service area. Moving on, there's just more substitutions of the department for the state board. Oh, I'm going to pause for Representative LeClaire. Go ahead, Rob. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. So, um, <clears throat> Betsy Ann, so does that mean that it would remove any and all discretion that an ambulance service may have as far as, um, especially if it's a, a for-profit entity? There would be this new standard that the ambulance service where am I? Uh, the ambulance service would have to provide its services without discrimination on those bases, income, funding source, severity of health needs. Um, this language is based on the current requirement for home health services to similarly provide their services um, in that non-discriminatory manner. But the, for details on how this works in practice, um, we'd have to get Department of Health to offer further testimony or further testimony from Drew because I, I can't answer with specificity how, what's going on in practice. I'm just not as familiar with this, um, but mm -hmm. I, can do, I can say on the Senate side, the Department of Health um, did not seem to have any issues with this language and worked on it with me. Well, some con a concern I have is, you know, there's a huge difference in reimbursement rates between, say, Medicaid and what private insurance pay. And especially on some of the more discretionary type of things like transfers or stuff like that, um, it, it sounds like that we're tying an entity's hands into they have to take absolutely everything. I have to think about that a little bit. Thank you. Okay, other committee discussion before we move on? All right. 
I am moving ahead on page 38, um, just on line 10. It it's, would now be the Department of Health that issues ambulance licenses rather than the state board. That's in accordance with that substitution. Section 28 is for the current health resource allocation plan to have to address EMS resources and needs. You can find that language beginning on page 39 on line 17. So this would require the Green Mountain Care Board when it's at developing the HRAP health resource allocation plan um, to identify priorities um, using info about EMS service service resources and needs that's identified by the EMS Advisory Committee. And so that's pursuant to another part of the bill further ahead where the EMS Advisory Committee would be tasked with identifying EMS resources and needs. Big picture so that HRAP addresses um, with more specificity what the EMS resources and needs are in the state. As we move ahead to page 40 in section 29, there is language that's a follow up to your bill that um, eliminated the requirement for an EMS personnel to be credentialed by their affiliated agency. Their affiliated agency is either, um, it's like your hospital or your, uh, an ambulance service or a first responder service. Um, there was the General Assembly eliminated the requirement for that credentialing by an affiliated agency because EMS personnel are still required to get licensed and then certified. But there maintains the current law requirement that you actually have to be affiliated with an affiliated agency in order to hold yourself out as an EMS personnel, an EMS provider. So a lot of these changes are um, just uh, maintaining that requirement and making it clear that it's still required to be affiliated with an affiliated agency. So you'll see throughout here references to um, affiliation being added in just to ensure that that's still reflected in the law. As we get to page 41, line 18, there is the requirement you heard, I think a testimony on from Professor Malone about Department of Health having to establish by rule at least three levels of EMS personnel instructors and in the education required for each level. Right now by Department of Health rule, there's only one level instructor. And they, uh, the proposal is to just allow more people to be able to be instructors to give different um, aspects of EMS training to address the EMS shortage. As we move through page 42, um, there is just using the defined term emergency medical treatment instead of care. You know, it's just a technical correction. Treatment is the defined term. There's language on page 42, line 17, just that uh, making explicit that there's an affiliation requirement still. It's no change to current law. Page 43 is, gets to that psychomotor skills testing. So we talked about this the other day where as a condition of national certification, you do have to get psychomotor skills testing, that hands-on testing to make sure that you're adequately trained to be EMS personnel. Um, that national certification does allow some of the lower license levels to either take NREMT psychomotor skills testing, or it could be part of a course. And the proposal from Professor Malone and uh, some of the other EMS providers is to allow psychomotor skills testing um, either by demonstrating those skills competencies as part of your education required for the license or by NREMT's uh, psychomotor exam. So it's an either or ability. And I think Rep. LeClaire raised his hand. Go ahead, Rob. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. So does that psychomotor term skill have to stay, stay, or could we just say hands-on? Um, It'd be easier for me if we said hands-on. I mean, is there a reason that it has to be referred to that way? I think it actually does. It, not only is it a common term, but I, I do think that NREMT discusses psychomotor examinations. And so I, I, it probably makes, the most sense to leave it in as psychomotor skills testing because that's what 
okay. all the EMS personnel were referring to it as. And I think it's because it's that NREMT requirement to have psychomotor skills testing. To use some other term, it just might cause even more confusion than psychomotor skills testing already does. Well, that term is as clear as mud for me. But <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Um, on page 44, line two, there's just another, um, and on line eight, more explicit statements to requiring affiliation with an affiliated agency. And then on line 11, that's a new requirement for DOH um, to establish a new entry level certification for what would be called Vermont EMS first responders. Um, the Senate proposed this. Um, it's not a license, it's a lower level certification, but it would just be another type of responder to get more people involved and authorized to perform um, emergency medical service response. What you're seeing on page 44, line 15, is just the repeal of an outdated transitional provision, doesn't belong in statute. It was when um, EMS personnel used to be certified. General Assembly had changed that to licensure, I think maybe in 2013, 2014. So that statute just not necessary to have anymore. On page 45, there's that sunset review. Um, it mirrors what you did for S233, the uniform licensing standards. It would require DOH to perform a sunset review at least once every five years to take a look at what it's required to renew your EMS license, the education or continuing competency requirements that are addressed, that are required for renewal to ensure big picture that it's not too restrictive, that um, maybe they could be loosened um, in order to make it less prohibitive for people to um, stay in the profession. And so it just uses your S233 language um, to require the department to conduct this review and what it has to look at in doing so. And then amending its rules um, when it finds that there are continuing competency requirements that are not necessary for the protection of the public. On page 46, we get to the EMS Advisory Committee that's in current law and a proposal to have them start an EMS Education Council. One of the things that EMS personnel actually required was for the EMS Advisory Committee to um, address in its annual report the annual number of mutual aid calls to an EMS service area that come from outside the area. So there could be a better picture of um, how the EMS system is getting stretched where some EMS providers have to go outside of their normal area to respond to emergency situations. Also related to what you saw earlier in HRAP, that health resource allocation plan, the language was that the Green Mountain Care Board had to identify EMS resources and needs from the EMS Advisory Committee. So related to that, here is the language at the bottom of page 46 that requires the EMS Advisory Committee to identify EMS resources and needs in each EMS district and provide that information to the Green Mountain Care Board to inform the board's periodic revisions to the HRAP that is um, developed pursuant to law that we already reviewed. I think it's a five-year renewal of the HRAP and then the, separately, another proposal that the Senate made is to require the establishment of an EMS Education Council, um, which can sponsor training and education programs required for licensure in accordance with Department of Health's required standards for training and education and provide advice to the Department of Health regarding the standards for EMS personnel licensure and any recommendations for changes to those standards to try to have more resources available for um, uh, providing training to EMS personnel. Section 30 is just an update. So this statute provides the current funding mechanism for EMS training. It actually flows through the Fire Service Training Council. And, but what's going on here is on page 48 is just, so this subdivision four currently provides that um, $150,000 gets allocated to the EMS Services Special Fund, 
um, for the provision of, of training programs. And it currently says for only EMTs, advanced EMTs and paramedics, what this would do is add in the new certified Vermont EMS first responder uh, certification that this bill would uh, enact into law, but then also allow it to be used for current licensed emergency medical responders, the EMRs. That's a current license type and they just weren't addressed in being able to get the, that, have access to that training funding. So that would add that there. Section 31 provides transitional provisions to make all this EM stuff, EMF uh, provisions happen. Um, so there'd be a rulemaking deadline of July 1 of next year because they are required to adopt some rules by the provisions of this act. As far as the ambulance service uh, language, um, that new requirement for the um, non-discriminatory qualifications and being able to obtain and maintain an ambulance service license uh, would apply beginning on July 1, 21. Um, and, uh, or it could be on the uh, effective date of the Department of Health's rules that they adopt because they were, they are required to adopt rules on how they're going to administer that non-discriminatory language. Um, and so it's, it takes effect on whatever, whichever date is later. The rules have to be there in place so they can administer that. The rules are currently uh, have a deadline of July 1, 21 uh, up above in a, sub A, but as you can see, it is possible for LCAR to extend that rulemaking deadline. LCAR has that authority. Um, page 49 in sub C, this is a transitional provision to address how the current instructors will transition into the new three levels. So currently there's only one level of instructor and this language is saying any person who's licensed as an EMS instructor coordinator um, under the Department of Rules in effect immediately prior to the date of the rules establishing the new three levels of instructor licenses are gonna be deemed to be licensed at the level that's consistent with the scope of practice for each of the three new levels. So it's like how to get the current people who are currently under that one license type into the appropriate license type when there's gonna be three of them. Subsection D is talking about the development of that new EMS first responder certification. So this would require Department of Health to consult with the EMS advisory committee University of Vermont's Initiative for Rural Emergency Medical Services and any other relevant stakeholders in developing that new Vermont EMS first responder certification um, so that it's established by July 1 of next year. And then finally, um, for, for that sunset review, that they'll have to undertake, this language is saying DOH would have to start its first one in conjunction with its rulemaking that's required by this act and thereafter propose any necessary statutory amendments in accordance with that sunset review. So they do have to review their rules and to go through rulemaking and at that time that's when they would be conducting their first sunset review because they'll already be in there looking at the rules. All right, there on EMS for now. So we're getting to the last section of your bill, um, public safety planning. What this language would do is strike that language that the Senate proposed that would require each town and city to have a public safety plan. Strike that. Including the transitional provision that said that happened to happen by July 1st, 2023. And then add the language um, that uh, Mr. Gregory addressed first thing this morning, which was instead to have the regional planning commissions do a one-time inventory of all these resources. So to actually specifically go through this language, this is providing the purpose of this section is to require each regional planning commission to create one inventory identifying the public safety resources of each town within its jurisdiction and to report that inventory to all of its towns so that each town can have a better, better understanding. Understanding, editors will catch that, but I'll catch that too on line 14. Oh, towns can better understand, sorry. I, I was right the first time. Uh, the public safety resources that are available to them and how those resources may be shared on a regional basis. And so you will have a change that you discussed this morning on line 16, 
um, to change that deadline to be July 1, 2022, not 2024 as it is right now. By July 1, 2022, each regional planning commission shall create and report to all of the towns within its jurisdiction that one inventory identifying all the public safety resources that each town within its jurisdiction relies upon for its public safety needs. And as part of this inventory, the inventory would need to identify, at the top of page 54, any mutual aid agreements for public safety resources that its towns may have, and any of its towns that have a public safety plan, which were a couple of the items that you addressed the other day. And then at the end, there's a definition of public safety resources. It means the law enforcement, fire, EMS, and dispatch entities that provide their services to a town. Rob LeClaire. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. So do we know for a fact that Department of Public Safety does not already have this information and have a process in place to capture this information? It seems to me that we had some testimony that they did. <clears throat> did I, am I missing something here? Anybody have a recollection of the details of that? I think that um, I think we supposed that they did with respect to um, policing services, but uh, but with respect to uh, fire and EMS and the various ways that dispatch for those three emergency services categories might um, might be acquired, it we weren't sure. I wasn't sure. But Betsy Ann? I think we were looking at um, the, in the context of emergency management, there is the requirement for there to be those emergency, uh, local emergency management planning committees that have to identify and report up the chain um, what sort of emergency management resources uh -huh. they have. But that's for the purpose of addressing all hazards events, so real emergencies. Um, so you might find that fine as is. Um, I think the one distinction with this is, um, whereas that current law requirement looks at emergency management for all hazards event, this is focused more on just addressing a town's standard public safety resources that it has um, outside of an all hazards event is the main distinction I see between the two. It's up, it's up to you to decide whether you think there's already, the information's already out there enough as is under the emergency management provisions. Rob, do you have a strong preference on that? I mean, it, it seems to me that the RPCs reporting that information back to municipalities, especially with respect to mutual aid agreements that are going on in their region might be helpful in prompting future conversations about how to collaborate with neighbors. Yes, um, I, I agree with that assessment, Madam Chair. Thank you. All right, and then we're at the end of the bill then, if you wanted me to move forward. Um, I do have uh, the effective date needed to change. It was July 1, 2020 as passed the Senate. Um, so right now it's set at October 1st, um, but as we discussed that council membership as currently written would take effect on November 15th. And then that language regarding uh, grants to law enforcement agencies being um, contingent on compliance with data reporting requirements. Um, S-219 already had that taking effect on January 1, 21. And so uh, similarly, the amendments to that section made in this bill um, would also be uh, taking effect on January 1, 21. Um, Warren Kitzmiller. So section 33 effective dates, uh, Number one, the council membership. Is this the point where Jim brought up the thought that, I mean, that date is less than a month away and that's going to be an awful lot of appointments in a very, very short period of time. A little bit of wiggle room would probably be a good thing. I would certainly ag agree with that if we wanted to postpone that some amount, maybe the end oh. of the year, January 1. 
as I read this, the council membership would have nearly two months because we're mid-September now. Um, the bill will be passed by the 25th and then it wouldn't be till November 15th, so. That's not much time. How are we gonna get the, there's a lot of people making appointments and how are we gonna get the word out to them and they have to talk to their whole membership and perhaps membership of other entities. And it just seems awfully tight to me. I don't know. I'd actually ask Jim if he's still holding that opinion and I'll, I'll go with the group, but just I worry that that's awfully tight. Uh, if JP. I may. Go ahead. Oh, I, I might that just was... follow up. Go ahead, JP, and then we'll come to Jim. I might just throw out a possible compromise of uh, December 1st. It gives them another two weeks, but maybe that'll help some. Jim? But any delay works. I guess I was given a little comfort that it may not be a full council on November 15th. Uh, and the council could still operate as long as they met and had a quorum of 13. Um, I, I totally agree with Warren. I think we're just setting ourselves up to rush and put some people on the council that maybe we didn't do due diligence on whoever's appointing, but um, whatever. Um, that's not the deal breaker for me at this point, but um, I appreciate Warren's sentiment and I support some change and i would ask if, if what's the rush is there is there any reason why we should not give them a little more time well i think the rationale that that i expressed earlier is that this council has some significant projects that we are asking them to embark on and that we wanted it to be the newly constituted council as opposed to um, the the current makeup of the council, that that's really the rationale. And the newly constituted council is going to be that balance of uh, law enforcement expertise coupled with um, you know civilian perspectives, so that when they're uh, when they're doing their work that has outlined in what used to be section 10A, what, what section is it now, Betsy Ann? <laughs> the, all the reports back? I think 16 now. Yeah. Okay. Um, all of the tasks that we're asking them to embark on, I think would be better accomplished with a balance. Um, other committee discussion on this? Bob Hooper? I, I'm sympathetic to Warren's comment, but I, I think, you know, so many of the positions are designated by who sits in a particular chair. And I think that in the public realm, there's so much uh, eagerness to get involved in this that, I mean, the, the VSEA person could probably be named tomorrow. I imagine they know exactly who they would put forward, as probably do the troopers. Um, I don't think in that realm, it's gonna take a long time to get people people forward because they've been looking to do this for a while. And I imagine have been giving serious consideration to who would be a good candidate. I'm somewhat thinking that it's not as big an issue as we're making it. Other perspectives, Rob? Well, I know you'd be disappointed if I didn't add mine. so I. My objective is not to disappoint you for sure. Um, I guess I do look at it quite differently is because we have such a diverse group and these are folks that have never been on this council before. Um, there is an awful lot of work that is being delegated to this council and you need to pick the right people, but you also have to have the right people to pick from. And that's people who are willing to put in the time and effort to do this. Um, I am concerned that we are get way too tight of a timeline here. Um, this is a very, very important job and people need to know what they're committing to. And 
to find the skill sets that are required out there because you know we can't have people at least from my perspective getting on this council just because they have one particular issue that they're interested in they're going to be asked to deal with a lot of different areas and i'd rather take a little time make sure that the groups that are being asked to have the opportunity to, to get the right people that have the interest to represent them thank you well i will um make note that uh that jp did offer up the idea that we would push that back to December 1st, which gives basically a full month from, um, from the time of election season to when uh, people are transitioning away from campaigning and back into their administrative roles, which might help them have the time and personnel to focus on this. So I guess I would ask um, the committee to consider JP's compromise proposal um warren and then mike oh mine mine is only a comment you are my chair and i will do as you wish uh, happily uh, if you think we should consider jp's compromise i'll support that but it's also 11 27 at the moment and you have three minutes to get into a different meeting <laughs> you are correct and i was hoping for a bio break um Rob, your hand is still up, but I, I'm gonna jump to Mike in case that was an, an inadvertent leaving your hand up. Go ahead, Mike. Sure, I'm, I'm ready to go with JP's compromise there. All right, can we straw poll that? Everybody okay with December 1st for the makeup of the new council? JP's not voting for it, but he proposed it. So I'm gonna assume that, <laughs> all right, good deal. <laughs> Thanks, JP. <laughs> All right, so why don't we go ahead and um, ask Betsy Ann to make that change. Um, I think that with the two minutes remaining, I'm going to suggest that we um, that we go ahead and go on break right now. That doesn't give Nolan time to come back and review the, um, the fiscal note with us, but um, what we'll do that immediately when we come back. So why don't we break for committee right now until um i don't have a sense of how long appropriations is going to need us um and so i don't want to take a full half hour if we don't need it um rob how long is your noon meeting likely to be well it it, it could be 45 minutes madam chair um if i can get out sooner I will I will I will keep you posted if that works for you yes um would you feel comfortable with us resuming in committee at 12 30 knowing that um you can always come back to sections of the bill that we may have already jogged or yes. skipped part yes I'll, I'll try to do that and I, I appreciate that thank you okay so why don't we um, break for committee for one hour right now, and we'll come back at 1230 in hopes that Rob can be done with his noon meeting in time to join us for a final walkthrough with uh, with Betsy Ann. JP, question? We're going to use the same uh, Zoom meeting thing or information, I would or assume do we need so. to change it? I think that'll still work, won't it? I would assume that we can jump back on the same meeting. Andrea? Okay. Yeah. Yes, we can. I, but I can send a new Zoom invitation to begin at 1230 if you'd like. And we can end this one. OK, why don't we do that? And um, for folks who are following along from the YouTube gallery, we'll be back at 1230. OK. See you in appropriations in a moment.